last presentation, my, my premise was to show that Matthew 16 is the second witness for Daniel 8, 13, and 14 for Palmoni. Daniel 8, 13, 14 uh, identifies the 2300 and the 2520 that come to a conclusion October 22nd, 1844. And in the question of verse 13 is where Christ as Palmoni is introduced, the wonderful number, the number of secrets. And although I have a, a, not a high aptitude in, in mathematical theory, which makes it less, it makes it more difficult for me to convey these thoughts from Matthew 16 that are there, um, we went to Matthew 16, 18, and showed that that verse is the expression of the mathematical, whatever it is, the mathematical term that is called phi, P-H-I. We made the connection between that and Philippi because that chapter takes place in Caesarea Philippi. We showed in that very verse, uh, we have Peter there, his numerical value of that, his name there is the 144,000. Um, we tied these things together while at the same time showing the, the significance of chapter 16 in terms of being a, a high mark of biblical chapters. There's, it's just, there's many, many things in there. Um, and then we, we went through Desire of Ages, page, chapter 45, that comments on Matthew 16. And we, I was going to go to, to chapter 46 um, because I was making, in yesterday's notes on page 9 of yesterday's notes, actually the day before yesterday's, there was, yesterday I had an extra handout um, that doesn't have a title. The yesterday's note starts with Matthew 16, 18 on top and the formula of Peter's name underneath it. Okay, so this one here was yesterday's notes and before it, the Midnight Cry notes are the ones I'm referring to. And in the Midnight Cry notes, I have all of chapter 45 and all of chapter 46 of Desire of Ages in there. We read through most of chapter 45. And what I was suggesting is that chapter 45 is the history of Trump. It's the history of 777 of Lamech. I was, I'm tying these various theme, biblical themes together all into showing the connection of them being the midnight cry. And uh, up here, let me remind us. Um, we have noted that from November 9th, 2019 to December 25, 2021 is 777 days. And that each of the days that are, uh, that are a point of reference for us, this one's a Sabbath, this one was a Sabbath, and of course July 18th, um, is a Sabbath. So you have a 777 that way. And even though Trump was elected over here in 2016, signed in in 2017, I'm saying that this here is focusing on the 45th president of the United States. It brings the story of Lamech, Methuselah, Noah, Enoch together. Um, it brings in the pool of Shiloh and Isaiah 6. It brings all these lines of prophecy into this history. But I was making a point that in Desire of Ages, it isn't an accident that when Sister White is commenting on chapter 16 of Matthew, that it's chapter 45 of Desire of Ages, because this is the history of the 45th president of the United States. But remember, 
This is also the history of the image of the beast test in the United States. And we've made an argument that this history that begins, I should have put that over here, begins on 718, is repeated, this image test is repeated in the world. Okay, so actually this would go over here, this image from July 18th. Image of the beast test in the United States followed by image of the beast test in the world. We went over this several times. This begins with the first Sunday law in the United States, ends with the Sunday, Sunday law of Daniel 11.41, which is a Sunday law that ends with the universal Sunday law down here. So both image of the beast testing times begin and end with Sunday laws. Uh, closed door, Daniel 11.41, Michael stands up, closed door here. The reason that I'm reminding us of these histories is because in Daniel 11, 44 and 45, you have the primary application of this history here from the Sunday law in the United States until the close of probation. Because in Daniel 11, verse 44, it says, And tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him, and he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away many, and he shall come to his end and none shall help. All right, just shrinking that down in a paraphrase. So the history here of this image test is the history of verse 44 and verse 45 in Daniel 11. And we've pointed out in the past that Grover Cleveland, and if you want to Google it so I can put it in the record correctly, Grover Cleveland was a, was a president, and then he, was, he lost the election, but he came back after losing that one election and got elected again. So he, he holds two uh, presidential terms distinct from one another. I mean, there's several presidents that have two terms, but they're back to back. But by doing so, Grover Cleveland becomes like the, I'm guessing now, the 23rd and the 25th. 22nd and, the 24th. 22nd and 24th president. But what that does is it makes Donald Trump the 44th president the 44th president in terms of the 44th person that was ever a president, but he's doing the 45th presidency, okay? So in this image of the beast testing time in the United States, Trump is 44, 45, and in this image of the beast testing time of the world, you have 44, 45, and therefore, um, I was going to go to Chapter 46 of Desire of Ages yesterday, okay? I, I looked at chapter 45, and what I was saying is chapter 45 is this history here. This is Paneum. This is Caesarea Philippi. Jesus is in Caesarea Philippi, telling the disciples about the cross, okay? Uh, but it's a foreshadowing of the cross. This here is going to be a cross, the first Sunday law. So back here... 2017, the Lord opens the understanding of Paneum up to, to us, and that's the foreshadowing, the advance warning of the coming event that marks the cross, July 18, 2020. So chapter 45 is telling that story, and then chapter 46 is the transfiguration, and I'm saying the transfiguration, among other things, is the lifting up of the ensign. Okay, and that takes place here. So this would be at that level. This would be chapter 45. This would be chapter 46. 46 also being a closed door in the terms of October 22nd, 1844 is when the door was closed. And that was the 46th year, 1798 to 1844. That closed door of October 22nd, 1844 is typifying a Sunday law. And we're marking... July 18th, 2020, as the beginning of the image of the beast testing time, and it begins with the Sunday law. So there's a transition from, at that level, chapter 45 to chapter 46. And at the end of the day, yesterday, Bronwyn came up, and, and she told me something. I know that I've done this before. Uh, she came across it, I think for herself, yesterday during class on her computer. Um, 
and she pointed it out to me. She says, I haven't, I haven't um, looked all the way through yet, but she found this thing. And I can remember that, that I've, I looked at this thing um, a couple of years ago as well, and we've looked at it for other concepts before, so it's not a new phenomenon. But what she said is, I, she says, while you were, <laughs> while we were having class yesterday, in terms of teacher-student relationship, I should take a ruler and smack her on the hand. She's supposed to pay attention. She's not supposed to get distracted on the computer. But what she did is, I'm making the claim that chapter 45 and chapter 46 of Desire of Ages, that the chapter numbers are plugging in with this history. So she went in and she says, there's only a handful of books in the Bible that even have 40, more, 46 chapters. And those books are Genesis, Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. I remember you doing Okay, it, she noticed that yesterday. So she was casually going through and looking at chapter 45 and 46, and she was realizing that those chapters were speaking to the same history that we're dealing with in chapter 45 and chapter 46 of Desire of Ages. So I remembered I did that before. So th this morning I got up and I took it one step further. And so we're going to take it one step further today. And the step further is, is that we're going to look at chapter 44, 45, and 46 in the Desire of Ages in terms of corresponding to the history that, that we're lining up on this history and knowing that the image of the beast testing time is 44 and 45 and it comes to a closed door, which is 46. Everyone follow my logic? Yes, you? Do you, Larry? Okay, so we've already put in place, we read yesterday a, a good portion of chapter 45. So I have notes today, if you'll go to the notes today, and we'll come back to chapter 46. But we'll start with chapter 44. Today's notes are chapter 44, the true sign from the desire of ages. <clears throat> so what am I saying? I don't like the way I did this. It's bugging me. All right. I'm, I, I want to get this straight. Because I, I put the image of the beast testing time. Where's it the At the top of these notes. You don't have them, probably. They're over there on the cabinet. This is the close of probation, Daniel 12.1. Okay, why does Michael stand up? Because human probation is over. Why is human probation over? Because the rebellion of mankind has reached its height. Yes? So when does Michael stand up? In Daniel 12, 1. What's 12 plus 1? 13. What's 13 a symbol of? Rebellion. So when Michael stands up, you have the number 13 in the verse, Daniel 12, 1. But what else do you have? When Michael stands up, you have the 144,000. Is 12 a symbol of the 144,000? Yes. And what did the 144,000 do? They perfectly reflect the character of the one, okay, which is Christ that stands up. So in the 12, 1, Daniel 12, 1, you have a closed door, close of probation here. You have the universal Sunday law, universal Sunday law. You have the 144,000 illustrated in the 12. You have Christ illustrated in the 1. And you have the height of rebellion illustrated in 12 plus 1 is 13. Yes? So what I'm saying is, from the Sunday law in the United States, this is Daniel 12, 1. This is Daniel 11, 41. From the Sunday law in the United States, this is the Sunday law, verse 41. You also have a closed door. Closed door here, because this 
is the history of the world image of the beast test. Image test. You may not remember it, but in this series we took time. We went to Revelation 13 and we identified that at verse 11 in Revelation 13, the United States speaks as a dragon, right? And then it goes out to the world, verses 12, 13, 14, and 15, and, and commands the world that they must set up an image of the beast, and the only definition of the image of the beast is the combination of church and state with the church in control of the relationship. And in verse 15, it says that the United States has the power to give life unto this world, image of the beast, beast that it would speak. Okay, so this is the image of the test for the world. But there's already been one in the USA. And this is the Little Sunday Law. The Little Sunday Law. It's the first Sunday Law in a series of Sunday Laws. And Sister White says if we we're going to understand how the Sunday Law comes in, we have to just go back into the history of the early church. And she takes us to the history of 321 with Constantine that leads to 538. Okay, <clears throat> this was pagan Rome. This is the first Sunday law in the United States. This was papal Rome. This is the Sunday law that's going to now sweep the world. From here to here, we have the image test in the USA. The coming together of church and state that begins here. Probably that began five days ago in earnest. I mean, you think about it. Five days ago, Trump declares a national day of prayer. Okay, you get it. You can see the logic why the leader of a nation would declare a day of prayer because of what's going on with this pandemic. But what day does he pick? He picks the day of the sun. Okay, we're going to have a, a, the day of the sun as the, the day that we dedicate to pray because of this pandemic. Uh, that is not the God of heaven. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath day, the seventh day Sabbath. So th this, this mentality is getting put in place as we speak. Okay, so here, Daniel 1141, Daniel 1211, in this history what I'm saying is we can see a 44 and a 45 because this is the history of the last president. Here we see Daniel 11. Verse 44 and 45. And this here we're marking as July 18th, 2020. And this as December 25th, 2021. But we're saying that this history here is the history of 777 that begins back here on November 9th, 2019. Because from November 9th, 2019 to December 25th, 2021 is 777 days. And we've, ran in the, we've read into the record recently, but we've done it more than once. All the ways that Donald Trump connects with 7777. But it's not simply Donald Trump. It's also um, that this date is a Sabbath, which is the seventh day. Sabbath. This date here is a seventh day Sabbath. And uh, this date here was the seventh day Sabbath. So from here to here, the three primary waymarks are all Sabbath. So you have seven, seven, seven that way also. Okay, so we're putting all that in place. What we're doing now, another layer of this, and what I want you to think about, the layer that we're putting in place now is my attempt to show that Matthew 16 is the second witness for Palmoni, the wonderful number. I, and I think you could see it, what we presented yesterday. Okay, the, the phi, 
Peter's name, bomb this rock, the whole story in Matthew 16. Um, but now on top of that, another layer to that is that when Sister White's commenting on Christ being in Caesarea Philippi, she does it in chapter 45 of the Desire of Ages. And what I was going to do, and then Bronwyn reminded me by her questions yesterday, what, what I intended to do today was to show how 40, chapter 46 is marking the end sign. Okay, and we, we understand the end sign gets lifted up here on July 18th. Okay, this is, this is where, well, that's what we better have in our experience if we're going to be part of the end sign, Christ in us, the hope of glory. But the end sign is lifted up because we've made a prediction, public prediction, about July 18th, 2020. And when it comes to pass, Anyone that's heard that prediction or thereafter hears about that prediction is going to say, how is it that these people could see this in advance? OK, it doesn't mean that we're going to be lifted up as heroes, uh, but we're, we're going to come to the attention of the world. OK, the, right here, you get lifted up as an ensign. So I'm saying that that what's the chapter title of, ver of what's the title of chapter 45 of desire of ages foreshadowing the cross okay i'm saying that this is the cross why is this the cross at that level well because this here is the su a sunday law is it not it's okay and the sunday law typifies October 22nd, 1844, and October 22nd, 1844 typifies the closed door. All these lines tell us that the cross is the closed door. Is there a closed door at the beginning of the image of the beast testing time? Yes, there is. Who gets called in at that point? The Levites begin to come in. This is the image of the beast testing time. So there's an ensign lifted up here. There's a cross. What did Jesus say about himself on the cross? If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto myself. Okay, so where the cross is, the end sign is lifted up. And so over here, because this is the image of the beast testing time in the United States, and this is the image of the beast testing time in the world, we need to have a cross over here. Because both image of the beast testing times need to have a cross at the beginning because of the same history, just one for the United States and the other for the world. So the ensign that gets lifted up here, who's it for? The Nethanims. Okay, so it's, it's parallel histories. So when Sister White in chapter 45, she's saying in this history here, okay, this history here, we're in the history of chapter 45 of Desire of Ages and the foreshadowing of the cross. This event here is casting this way. We're supposed to understand this. And I'm saying that the Lord began to allow us to see this back in, I'd, I wished I knew the month. It's at the very beginning of 2017. There would be a way to figure that out. We could go back in and see when it was that I took the trip to Canada at the beginning of 2017, because that's when it was presented. And we could, we could nail it down even to the date, if that's important. So the Lord begins to open up what here? Paneum. We're, we're identifying now more directly Paneum. We got a date on it. We didn't have that then, but we began to see what Paneum was going to bring. Here in 2017, we said that when you get to Paneum, you're going to have a pandemic and a panic, among other things. And you got the pandemic and the panic happening right now. Okay, so this here is the, the history of chapter 45, the foreshadowing of the cross. And I'm saying that chapter 46, the transfiguration of Christ upon the Mount of Transfiguration with Elijah and Moses with him, he's lifted up as an ensign, okay? That this is, and, and it's the, the sign of the second coming. So I'm saying that this here would be chapter 46, if we're doing chapters, okay? But where we're going to start is in chapter 44. Okay. 
I, I, once Brahman t tuned me in on that, I went back and looked. So today's notes begin with chapter 44. We won't read the whole chapter, but we will take some things out of it. And it's called the true sign. And we mentioned this yesterday. And this is where I have a comfort level about the shaking that's went on in this movement. Okay, my comfort level is, is that I can look back at what this movement has understood prophetically over the past several years and find that in spite of all the human imperfections, the message that's been coming through here is becoming more and more validated every day. Whereas the message that's coming out of those people that have left this movement, it becomes more and more ridiculous every day. Okay, so, so the point is, is chapter 44 over here, it's about the true sign. And it's about the fourth generation, a wicked and adulterous generation. These are the chapters. And this fourth generation is looking for a sign, and this chapter is going to tell us that the sign isn't some fantastic miracle. The sign is the message. It says, so here, in chapter 44, before you get to chapter 45, it's about the message. When you get to chapter 45, then it's going to tell you what the message is. It's about paneum. And when you get to chapter 46, it's going to tell you about the lifting up of the ensign. And that's the exact sequence of events that we've always plugged into the prophetic narrative. And I'm saying that it is illustrated in chapter 44, 45, 46 of Desire of Ages. And before, we won't go there, but I'm going to point you to the end of your notes, of today's notes. On page four, and I'm, I'm going to tell, I'm, I'm telling you that you can go in to Genesis chapter 44 through 46, and what it's going to tell you about is the Lord entering into covenant with the people, and it's the story of the joining of the two sticks. When do the two sticks get joined? In this history right here. And chapters 44, 45, 46 of Genesis are telling that story. Okay. Psalms 44 through 46 emphasizes the need to return to the old past, a spiritual war that's going to take place, and the ensign getting lifted up. Is there a need to go back to the old past back here? Is there a spiritual war that begins here? Does the end sign get lifted up here? That's Psalm chapter 44, 45, and 46. Isaiah 44 through 46 is about choosing his people. He's going to choose Jerusalem. It's about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the confrontation with idolatry. The confrontation with, about, with idolatry is the confrontation between false and true prophecy. It's the story of, of, the, of Carmel. Okay, and, but, that, but remember, all of this, all of this what? Goes over here too, because the same kind of advance work to this cross takes place in advance to this cross. So you're taking, you can take 44, 45, 46 of these chapters and step them forward here. And in Jeremiah 44 through 46, you will see a rebuke about placing your confidence in Egypt. Who's that? That's Jeroboam, 1 Kings 13. That's Aaron. That's this Omega movement. That's Adventism. Okay, Egypt is the world. And it also is a prediction of the Sunday law. In these chapters in Jeremiah 44 through 46, it's a warning about Nebuchadnezzar coming to conquer Jerusalem. And in there he talks about building and destroying Jerusalem. And that's what we've been teaching for a long time. Right here, at the midnight cry, this is the midnight cry, Jerusalem is chosen. Jerusalem is going to get chosen over here as well. But when the Lord is choosing Jerusalem, He's also destroying Jerusalem. He's destroying old Jerusalem and raising up new Jerusalem. 
When I say raising up, why do I say that? Isaiah chapter 2. The glorious holy mountain is going to be lifted up above all the mountains. A glorious holy mountain is Jerusalem. It's Zion. It's the end sign. Okay, so these chapters... And the problem with Ezekiel, Ezekiel has chapter 44, 45, 46, not a problem. But with Ezekiel, if you're going to plug it in, it's a little bit different. Really, you have to go back to verse 40, because in verse 40 of Ezekiel, chapter 40, in chapter 40 of Ezekiel is the introduction of the spiritual temple that was never built Ezekiel speaks about a temple, and it begins in verse 40. When does that begin? That would be 1989. And, and all the following chapters here are speaking to the raising up of the temple. So 44, 45, 46 chapters in Ezekiel, they fit in here because this is where the temple that Ezekiel's predicting at the end of the world gets raised up. But it's a rather long passage that focuses on the details of that temple. But don't miss that it begins in Daniel 11, verse 40, chapter 40 of Ezekiel, the time of the end. Okay, so um, then if you go, next page, to Patriarchs and Prophets, chapter 44. Moses just died and they're crossing the Jordan. Chapter 45, it's the fall of Jericho. And chapter 46, it's blessings and cursings. And it's so easy to plug all of that in. Okay, for, for, let me give you just one example. Here, here at one level, this is the end of Adventism. This is when the 144,000 are being lifted up as an ensign for the Levites. But... The former covenant people, Adventism, they've been progressively being passed by. Okay, they didn't see the light in 1989. Then Saul dies at 9-11. Um, it's a progressive destruction of Adventism as the covenant people. But right here at Jerusalem, the Lord now is choosing, lifting up the new Jerusalem while he's taking down the old Jerusalem. So this is the destruction of the covenant people that are the Seventh-day Adventist church. It's going to happen again in a bigger way down here. But we've contended for a long time that right here there will be a, an initial Sunday law in the United States and the Seventh-day Adventist church is going to agree to it. That's the death toll for them, even though you still got the Sunday law, verse 41. Everyone with me? When they end here, where did their rebellion begin? Adventist Church. Where did their rebellion begin? 1863. And what happened in 1863? Among other things, lots of prophecies fulfilled. Civil War, Civil War. keep going. They, they started a church and they started a church and what happened to their oldest son? And what happened to their youngest son? Okay, one of them died when they began discussing starting a church, and the other one died when they were printing this, they were printing the 63 chart, okay? So one of them died when they were starting the church, and the other one died when they were getting rid of those charts, correct? And it was their oldest son and their youngest son. What prophecy is that? What's your point of reference for that story? What, what right do you have to make that claim? Jericho. Jericho. When they, when they come out in, in Patriarchs and Prophets, when they cross the Jordan, they tear down Jericho, but there's a curse placed upon Jericho. So the curse is the man that rebuilds Jericho. He will lay the foundations with his youngest son and with his oldest son, the, what is it, the... I forget, there's another connection with the construction of Jericho that he loses his oldest son. And sure enough, the Bible speaks about the man that rebuilt Jericho, lost his youngest and his oldest son. Right? And we use that story to go to James and Ellen White. So if their rebellion began in 1863, and that story is about Jericho being destroyed and rebuilt in 1863, they did what? 
they rebuilt Jericho. And right here at the end of their probationary time, Jericho comes down. Okay, so I'm saying, what I'm saying without getting into the details is these chapters, they are not just vague generalities. They're speaking specifically to the prophetic line that we've been dealing with for quite some time. Would it have any significance as far as the first and the last dying again? Because, you know, we know history is repeated and we know you're looking for some children to die a beginning and an ending uh, I'm not perhaps, looking for any children to die but no I'm I know what you mean. I'm saying prophetically yeah yeah I, I like I said we're just scraping the surface here we're scraping the surface to show you Palmoni was in control of the chapters of the Bible and the chapters in the spirit of prophecy and that he's always speaking to the end of the world and that the verses that govern the end of the world are Daniel 11, 40 to 45. So the chapters, the verses in the Bible, the numbers in the Bible that correspond to that often speak to this history. In Prophets and Kings, there's a little bit of different, a little twist. You have chapter 45, 44, 45, and 46. And chapter 44 is, is, is in the lion's den. Okay? Daniel's thrown in the lion's den. <clears throat> When was, when's Daniel thrown in the lion's den? Well, I would argue that probably back here at 9-11. Why is, why is that? Why would Daniel be thrown in the lion's den at 9-11? Now, you can put it further on. It, it'll, it'll line up better with this particular structure. But why at 9-11 is Daniel thrown in the lion's den? The other presidents, I guess you would call them the leaders of the nation, they conspired to... Um, okay. Get him in trouble. Okay, so there's a there's a conspiracy there, and at 9/11 you can go in the scriptures and show that there's a debate and a conspiracy. That wasn't what I was getting at. At 9/11 the sealing of the 144,000 began, and what does Darius do when he throws Daniel in the lion's den? He takes his signet and he seals it. Okay, identifying that this is the sealing of Daniel. So Daniel's sealing begins at 9/11. That's chapter 45 of Prophets and Kings. And chapter um, 44. 44. Yeah, I'm, I, I. Also, you have uh, it's Daniel chapter 4 that deals with Daniel and the lion's den. So you have a doubling there of the 4 4. Okay, but don't, don't get me off there. I'm trying to figure out why I have this six slash exile. Oh, okay, I know what I did. I didn't, okay, in your notes it says, Prophets and Kings, chapter 44, in the lion's den. And then I was supposed to push where it says section to the next line. It, section six, okay. Chapter 45 begins with a, an extra subtitle, which says section six, after the exile, and then it quotes, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Zechariah 3, 2. And then chapter 45, the title is, is The Return of the Exiles. So right here, right here, after chapter 45, Daniel's in the lion's, lion's den. And when you get to chapter 45, this is after the exile. Daniel's been in the lion's den. Now he's out of exile. And the Lord is choosing Jerusalem. And this is right where we say the Lord chooses Jerusalem. This is the first day of the fifth month. This is the midnight cry. Okay, so this chapter is squaring up. The Lord is choosing Jerusalem here. And then in chapter 46, it's, the title is The Prophets of God Helping Them. And what we've said is that at this point, this is the church triumphant, right? And what does Isaiah, a lot of things about the church triumphant, but what is the, the place in Isaiah that I often go to to deal with the church triumphant and the midnight cry? What does it say? Awake, awake, O Jerusalem, and put up, uh, put up on yourself your beautiful garments and no more unclean or uncircumcised will walk through you anymore forever or something like that. Poor paraphrase. But the point is, the church triumphant here 
is no longer a mixture of wheat and tares, correct? And what does Sister White say when the church is free from tares always exists? Every gift. Every gift is active when the church is free of tares. So what's that mean? The spirit of prophecy is restored. And what is chapter 46 of Prophets and Kings? The prophets of God helping them. Okay, so I'm saying that in the Conflict of the Ages series, chapters 44, 45, and 46, they're speaking to this history. And then you got Acts of the Apostles. And in chapter 44, Paul's in Caesar's household. He's in Rome. He's, uh, he's going to be successful in Rome. He's, in, in spite of being bound, in, you know, bound by circumstances and chains in Rome, he's still going to carry forward his work. Um, and then the letters in chapter 45 that are written from Rome are the, the witness that go out to all the churches around the world preparing them to receive this gospel message. And here he's at liberty. Okay, so this history here is about the work of the gospel, the everlasting gospel that's been given to the 144,000 that goes through a time period of hiding and some, some spiritual bondage, lack of freedom to prosecute the message. But when you get to chapter 46 right here, the gospel is going to go to every creature in the world. Here it's the Levites, but when you move this over to here, it's the Nethanims. Do you follow that? <laughs> I'm telling you, when you read through these chap chapters in the Bible and in the Conflict of the Ages series, you may be thinking to yourself, am I forcing this? Is this really, really saying this? And, and all you have to do is just go to some other chapters. And see if you have the ability to take chapter 32, 33, and 34 of any of those books and force them into this history, and you can't do it. This isn't a force. This isn't a, a construction of thought to uphold a premise. It's there. And Palmoni is the one that made sure of it by putting these truths in these Bible books and in the Conflict of the Ages series where they fit. And by the way, the Great Controversy doesn't have that many chapters. That's why it isn't there. Mm -hmm. So, chapter 44, the true sign. And let's start in the, the, the second long paragraph. Jesus went up into a mountain, and there the multitude flocked to him, bringing their sick and lame, and laying them at his feet. He healed them all. By the way, this is chapter 44. Okay, so this would be, I'm arguing this would be in the history before July 18th. Let's just keep it at that. Okay. Um, For three days they continued to throng about the Savior, sleeping at night in the open air and through the day, pressing eagerly to hear the words of Christ and to see his works. At the end of three days, their food was spent. Jesus would not send them away hungry. And he called upon his disciples to give them food. Again, the disciples revealed their unbelief. So before July 18th, 2020, what does this movement have? Unbelief. unbelief. Okay, there's, we're, we're still not believing fully as we should the message. To go back down into Gideon that camp. Was, Gideon was, you could look at Gideon as being full of unbelief all the way, all the yep. way along yep. until January 11th. At Bethsaida, they had seen how, with Christ's blessing, their little store availed for the feeding of the multitude, yet they did not now bring forward their all trusting his power to multiply it for the hungry crowds. Moreover, those whom he fed at Bethsaida were Jews. These were Gentiles and heathen. Okay, so there's a doubling of feeding going on in the, at least referencing that first the Jews and now the world. He's feeding them food. Jewish prejudice was still strong in the hearts of the disciples and they answered Jesus, whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? 
But obedient to his word, they brought him what they had, seven loaves and two fishes. The multitudes were fed, seven large bas- baskets of fragments remaining. Four thousand men, besides women and children, were thus refreshed, and Jesus sent them away with glad and grateful hearts. Skipping the next paragraph. A deputation of Pharisees had been joined by representatives from the rich and lordly Sadducees. This is an important point, for me at least. A deputation of Pharisees had been joined by a representative of, from the rich and lordly Sadducees, the party of the priests, the skeptics and aristo- aristocr- aristocracy, aristocr- aristocracy. aristocracy of the nation. Thank you. The two sects had been bitter been at bitter enmity. The Pharisees and Sadducees, they do not get along. Who are the Pharisees and Sadducees? Conservatives and liberals. They don't get along. The Sadducees, but but in the, the context of the message, in the context of Christ's ability to give a message represented by f- food, f- bread, and it's a message that's always more than enough more than you can eat and carry some home, in that context, the Pharisees and Sadducees are going to come together. The Sadducees courted the favor of the ruling power in order to maintain their own position and authority. The Pharisees, on the other hand, fostered the popular hatred against the Romans, longing for the time when they would, could throw off the yoke of the conqueror. But Pharisee and Sadducee now united against Christ. Like seeks like and evil wherever it exists, leagues with evil for the destruction of the good. And I would, would say that this, this coming together of liberal and conservative of Pharisee and Sadducee, doing that right now. That it's doing it at, at, in what we're looking at at several levels in the world, in the political world, in the political world in the United States, and in the religious world, and in the religious world of this movement, you can see that. What I, what I want you to connect there, though, is the word league. League is a, a, a prophetic word. It's a confederacy. They come into a confederacy. What, are they co- what, <coughs> what circumstances are taking place when they come into confederacy? The bread. The miracle bread. It's over the message. The message is what they're going to fight against. Okay. 9-11 really wasn't 9-11. Okay, there really is no threefold union. The, the Time of the End magazine is not really true. There is no Sunday law. Um, they're fighting over the message, the bread, okay? Now the Pharisees, next page two, top of the page. Now the Pharisees and Sadducees came to Christ. They've been united, asking for a sign from heaven. When in the days of Joshua, Israel went out to battle with the Canaanites at Beth, Bo- Beth Horon, the sun had stood still at the leader's command until victory was gained, and many similar wonders had been manifest in their history. Some such sign was demanded of Jesus, but these signs were not what the Jews needed. No, more, no mere external evidence could benefit them. What they needed was not intellectual enlightenment, but spiritual renovation. Oh, you hypocrites, said Jesus, you can discern the face of the sky. By studying the sky, they could foretell the weather. But can you not discern the signs of the times? What's the signs of the times? It's what's happening right now on planet Earth. How do we know that's the signs of the times? Because the prophetic message we've been handling has told us this is what's going to take place in advance. It's the message. And these people have heard the message but they don't understand that that is the sign that they're supposed to be impacted by, so they choose a message that is to their own personal liking that will exalt them and, and let them feel comfortable in their sinful experience. Christ's own, were, Christ own, Christ's own words, spoken with the power of the Holy Spirit that convicted them of sin, were the sign that God had given for their salvation. Christ's own word. What's Christ's own word that convicts of sin? What does Sister White call this? She calls it probably lots of things, but the one I'm looking for is the great convictor of sin. Is this God's word? Okay, this was their sign. 
This was the sign that they should have been looking for. And signs direct from heaven had been given to attest to the mission of Christ, the song of the angels to the shepherds, the star that guided the wise men, and dove and the voice from heaven at his baptism were witnesses for him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, Why does this generation seek after a sign? Fourth generation. There shall be no sign given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, Christ was to be the same time in the heart of the earth. And as the preaching of Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so Christ's preaching was assigned to his generation. So what I want to throw in here, if, if you will see it, is in chapter 44, if, if we would look up there where 44's got the little red squiggle underneath it, in that history, what I'm saying is, the controversy is going to be over the message. But what else, can we, what else can we glean from that controversy over the message from what we just read? That somehow, some way, it has a number three involved. And I'm saying the message is a midnight cry. And that the number three is the first step, Ezra 7, 9. And the second step was December 17th with Rafi and Paneum. And the third step is the chronology that leads us to November 9th. So where you see the number 44 with the squiggle, it's talking about the midnight cry message for the priests and that it's the message of Jonah that was three days and three nights in the belly of the well. He was hidden. And that number three is part of our prophetic scenario that we put in the record before we even came to dissect this chapter. Okay, But what a contrast in the reception of the word. The people of the great heathen city trembled, the ones when Jonah went to Nineveh, trembled as they heard the warning from God. Kings and nobles humbled themselves. The high and the lowly together cried to God of heaven, and his mercy was granted unto them. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation, Christ had said, and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Every miracle that Christ performed was a sign of his divinity. He was doing the very work that had been foretold of the Messiah. But to the Pharisees, these works of mercy were a positive offense. The work that was Christ was doing was misrepresented. To them, it was a positive offense. As one example about what I'm saying, when we set up how we were going to manage this school, we determined to do it by the blueprint of the spirit of prophecy, and the spirit of prophecy is crystal clear that the students that were to be here are students that should, have, should want to be here, first off. And if they wanted to be here, then they, they needed to follow those guidelines from the spirit of prophecy. And those guidelines said that you have to balance your work with 50% physical and 50% mental or spiritual study. And if you're going to err on the side of either, then do more practical, physical labor. And... When this controversy reaches its head here in the recent past, the work that Christ had done in this history was a positive offense to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Jewish leaders looked with heartless indifference on human suffering. In many cases, their selfishness and impression had caused the affliction that Christ relieved. Thus his miracles were to them a reproach. People came to this school that needed genuine spiritual instruction, balanced instruction, to lift them up out of their own peculiar problematic state, whatever it would be, have been. And the Pharisees and Sadducees could not see that that was Christ's effort to redeem them by the program he put in place here, and they fought it. That which led the Jews to reject the Savior's work was the highest evidence of his divine character. The greatest significance of his miracles is seen in the fact that they were for the blessing of humanity. The highest evidence that he came from God is that his life revealed the character of God. He did the works and spoke the words of God. 
Such a life is the greatest of all miracles. He did the works and spoke the words of God. He presented the Bible in the spirit of prophecy, and he governed the ministry based upon the guidance of the Bible in spirit of prophecy. That's the works he did. They had to agree. And that was the evidence that the ministry was correct. When the message of truth is presented in our day, the reason I took time waxing eloquent about this is because this next sentence, she brings all this down as a lesson for us. When the message of truth is presented in our day, there are many who, like the Jews, cry, show us a sign, work us a miracle. Christ wrought no miracle at the demand of the Pharisees. He wrought no miracle in the wilderness in answer to Satan's insinuations. He does not impart to us power to vindicate ourselves or to satisfy the demands of unbelief and pride. But the gospel is not without a sign of its divine origin. It is not a miracle that we can break from the bondage. Is it not a miracle that we can break from the bondage of Satan? Enmity against Satan is not natural to the human heart. It is implanted by the grace of God. When one who has been controlled by a stubborn, wayward will is set free and yields himself wholeheartedly to the drawing of God's heavenly agencies, a miracle is wrought. So also when a man who has been under strong delusion comes to understand moral truth. Amen. I kind of kicked that sentence around as far as the timing of it because I, I was thinking of one student here that came here, if everyone in here knew him, and you would agree with me, he came here full of himself. He was here a couple of trimesters. But before he left that second trimester, he, he had broken. It, it, uh, you could tell the Lord wasn't through with him, but he'd broken. He'd, he'd began to turn around. And then he left and he went the wrong direction. But you could see, you could see the influence of this school turning this, brother upside down. Of these people that have been under the delusion of um, Parminder and Tess came to us after they had left the school saying, this has been the greatest experience of my life. And so I don't even care what they said about our programs and stuff. There were individuals, too many of them, that came to us and said, thank you. Yeah, I agree. We could, we could put our minds together and go back and and name a bunch of names. It's just when I was reading that one guy popped into my mind and then then he's well afterwards I'll tell you and then he he went 180 degrees and anyway uh, where was I uh, when one who has been controlled by a stubborn wayward will is set free and yields himself wholeheartedly to the drawing of God's heavenly agencies a miracle is wrought so also when a man who has been under strong delusion comes to understand moral truth Every time a soul is converted and learns to love God and keep his commandments, the promise of God is fulfilled. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. The change in human hearts, the transformation of human characters is a miracle that reveals an ever-living Savior working to rescue souls. A consistent life in Christ is a great miracle. In the preaching of the word of God, the sign that should be manifest now and always is the presence of the Holy Spirit to make the word a regenerating power to those that hear. This is God's witness before the world to the divine mission of his son. Don't miss, we had an argument here early on at this school uh, by the soldier uh, promoted this argument about against this thought, this thought being that the sign that this generation needs to see is the message. It needs to see the message, not just the intellectual message, but the message that's proclaimed by a person that is living out the message in their own experience as well. Um, turn to the next page. I'll pass over a few, few paragraphs to get beyond this. Top of page four. The leaven placed in the meal works imperceptibly, changing the whole mass to its own nature. So if hypocrisy is allowed to exist in the heart, it permeates the character and the life. A striking example of the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, a striking example of the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, Christ had already rebuked in denouncing the practice of Corban, by which a neglect of filial duty was concealed under the pretense of liberality to the temple. 
the scribes and Pharisees were insinuating deceptive principles. They concealed their real tendency of their doctrines and improved every occasion to instill them artfully into the minds of their hearers. Wow. These false principles, when once accepted, worked like leaven in the mill, permeating and transforming the character. It was this deceptive teaching that made it so hard for the people to receive the words of Christ. Yeah. Ever see that happen? Wow. That, that ha is what I'm saying. That's happening in chapter 45, okay? It's happening in chapter 45 before chapter 46. The same influences are working today through those who try to explain the law of God in such a way as to make it conform to their practices. Okay, the, the controversy over the law of God is not the Sabbath Sunday law issue. It's about homosexual rights. I mean, it's about women's rights. The same influences are working today through those who try to explain the law of God in such a way as to make it conform to their practices. This class do not attack the law openly, but put forward speculative, th speculative theories that undermine its principles. They explain it so as to destroy its force. The hypocrisy of the Pharisees was the product of self-seeking, the glorification of this themselves was the object of their lives. This has been my argument. I've always been in the minority of this argument about those that have left here. Uh, there's an argument that goes on among us. It's not a big argument, but a discussion. And the discussion is, is the people involved, they're convinced they're doing it for money. I'm saying, no, man, they're not doing it for money. They're doing it for that. The hypocrisy of the Pharisees was the product of self-seeking. The glorification of themselves was the object was of the their lives. Whole thing with I, I purposely is leaving name thing. out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm saying that chapter 44 of Desire of Ages is this history. This is where this controversy goes over, and the controversy is over the message, and the message is the sign of Jonah. And the sign of Jonah has a three-step process in it because he was three days in the belly of the whale. That's marked in here. It's marked in the scriptures. And we've seen the message in our history, the message of the midnight cry has three steps through three dirty waters to get to the pool of living water. So I'm saying that's chapter 44. We've already looked at chapter 45. Chapter 45 yesterday is, is given in Caesarea Philippi it's given before you get to Caesarea Philippi, which would be Paneum right here. But it's foreshadowing the cross. It's the, the testimony about what's coming here at Paneum. You follow me? So I'm saying that chapter 46, and I'm going to the notes from two days ago on page 9, where it says chapter 46, he was transfigured. I'm saying that right here, chapter 46 kicks in, and that the transfiguration, among other things, is an ensign that is lifted up, okay? So 44 is about the argument over the message. 45 is the message. It's Elijah's offering of July 18th, Paneum. Chapter 46 says, evening is drawing on as Jesus calls to his side three of his disciples. Page nine. You there? Yeah. Are you? It says chapter 46, he was transfigured. Evening is drawing on as Jesus calls to his side three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, and leads them across the fields and far up a rugged path to a lonely mountainside. The Savior and his disciples have spent the day in traveling and teaching, and the mountain climb adds to their weariness. Christ has lifted burdens from mind and body of many sufferers. He has sent the thrill of life through their enfeebled frames, but he also is compassed with humanity, and with his disciples he is wearied with the ascent. The light of the setting sun still lingers on the mountaintop. I'm not sure what this, this means, but I'm sure it fits. I'm saying the transfiguration is July 18, 2020. It's the end sign. And between... Caesarea Philippi and the Mount of Transfiguration is six days. 
That's got to mean something. Okay, I'm just throwing that out there as I think about it. The light of the setting sun still lingers on the mountaintop and gilds with a fading glory the path they are traveling. But soon the light dies out from the hill as well as the valley and the sun, the sun disappears behind the western horizon. And the solitary, solitary travelers are wrapped up, wrapped in the darkness of, the, of night. The gloom of their surroundings seems in harmony with their sorrowful lives around which the clouds are gathering and thickening. The disciples do not venture to ask Christ whither he is going or for what purpose. He has often spent entire nights in the mountains in, salt, in prayer. He whose hand formed mountain and valley is at home with nature and enjoys its quietude. The disciples follow where Christ leads the way, yet they wonder why the Master should lead them up this toilsome ascent when they are weary and when he too is in need of rest. Presently, Christ tells them they are now to go no farther. Stepping a little aside from them, the man of sorrows poured out, pours out his supplications with strong crying and tears. He pro prays for strength to endure the test in behalf of humanity. So he's going to be tested. What was his test? Well, he probably had several tests, but what's the primary test? The cross, right? Yeah. Maybe in the wilderness, but the cross. Yeah. And we're, we're marking the cross on July 18th. He's praying now. Christ is praying for strength for his test. He prays for strength to endure the test on behalf of humanity. He must himself gain a fresh hold on omnipotence, for only thus can he contemplate the future. And he pours out his heart longings for his disciples that in the hour of the power of darkness their faith may not fail. The dew is heavy upon his brow form, but he heeds it not. The shadows of night gather thickly about him, and he regards not their gloom. So the hours pass slowly by. At first, the disciples unite their prayers. Like midnight, that'd be like the shadows of night gather thickly about him. That would be almost, you know. Yeah, it'd be midnight. Probably Not midnight. a problem. This is the midnight cry. Yeah. July 18th is a midnight cry. Uh, Jesus had told them of even... At first, the disciples unite their prayers with his in sincere devotion, but after a time, they are overcome with weariness, and even while trying to retain their interest in the scene, they fall asleep. Jesus has told them of his sufferings. He has taken them with him that they might unite him with him in prayer. Even now, he is praying for them. The Savior has seen the gloom of the disciples and has longed to lighten their grief by an assurance that their faith has not been in vain. Not all, even of the twelve, can receive the revelation he desires to give. Only the three who are the witnesses, who are to witness his anguish in Gethsemane, have been chosen to be with him on the mount. Did you get that? What does that tell you? Just as a student of prophecy. Only the three. Okay, you, 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 you yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. Here's what it tells me. Here's what it tells me. That on July 18th, he took three. Okay? Peter, James, and John. And they're the only ones that are going to be able to go with him afterwards to the cross in Gethsemane. To Gethsemane. Gethsemane is the cross too, right? It's leading to the cross. So do you have two crosses there? Yeah, so you've got... The three there at Paneum on July 18th are going to also be repeated at the Sunday Law on December 25th. You follow that? It's, it's just, all I'm saying is it's illustrating the... the no, it's, illustri it's illustrating that what we're teaching about the image test in the United States being repeated as the image test in the world, it's perfect. Here, the three that go to... The Mount of Transfiguration with him are the same three that are going to be over here with him at the cross in Gethsemane. Okay, it's just the same prophetic characteristics that we've been putting up there. Only the three who are witness, only the three who are to witness his anguish in Gethsemane have been chosen to be with him on the mount. Now the burden of his prayer is that they may be given a manifestation of the glory. He had with the Father before the world was that his kingdom may be revealed to human eyes. That what? His kingdom may be revealed to human eyes. And what attribute of his kingdom? His glory. Okay, this is what's happening right here. His glory is to be revealed to human eyes. 
And the three persons that are there are the three persons that are going to be down here at the cross at Gethsemane. And it's at the cross. He says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto myself. So I'm making the argument that this is definitely the end sign. OK, this is the end sign getting lifted up here and here. The end sign gets lifted up at the beginning of the image test, whether it's in the United States or the world. You need to test everything that I say, right? Everything that anyone says. I'm telling you, the argument I'm making about the two image of the beast periods of time, it not only is it airtight, it's what puts this message over and above any other message that's out there. This is, there's a consistency in what we're seeing from the various lines in the scriptures that there's no way it can be a human invention. With the three, they talk about three being with them one stage and three being with them again, would that be the three angels' messages? The three angels' messages? Not a problem. Not a problem. The three angels' messages. What does John see in Revelation 14? He sees three angels going to give the everlasting gospel to the world, flying in the midst of heaven. This is the end sign. The third angel's message at July 18th is the end sign for the Levites. The third angel's message at the Sunday law is the end sign for the Nethanims. Peter, James, and John are the three angels' messages. And it's part of a... So, was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego the three angels' messages? And when they were thrown in the fiery furnace, who appeared with them? The fourth, the fourth who was Christ. Okay, so they're going to come to that point, And at the Mount of Transfiguration, the, the three-one combination is illustrated when Moses and Elijah disappear. Okay, I, I, let me find where I was. Now the burden of his prayer is that they may be given the manifestation of the glory he had with the Father before the world was, that his kingdom may be revealed to human eyes, and that his disciples may be strengthened to behold it. He pleads that they may witness a manifestation of his divinity that will comfort them in their hour of supreme agony with the knowledge that he is of a surety, the Son of God, and that his shameful death is a part of the plan of redemption. Let me ask you something. From the Sunday law in the United States to the close of probation, is this an hour? This is the hour the ten kings agree to give their kingdom to the beast. And this is an hour of the most severe persecution of human history. So if this hour is a supreme testing time for his disciples, is this an hour that's a supreme testing time? Mm -hmm. Yes. So what, he's just, what Jesus has just prayed for is that they would see this end sign that it would strengthen them for this hour of persecution. And then they're over here. They're going to get strengthened again for this hour of persecution. I'm telling you, it fits together like a hand in a glove. The glove is a perfect fit, as Loughborough speaks about. Um, his prayer is heard. When he's bowed in lowliness upon the stony ground, suddenly the heavens open, the golden gates of the city of God are thrown wide, and holy radiance descends upon the mount, enshrouding the Savior's form. Divinity from within flashes through humanity and meets the glory coming from above. Arising from his prostate position, Christ stands in godlike majesty. The soul agony is gone. His countenance now shines as the sun, and his garments are white as the light. What do you have here? You have the sun. And you have, therefore, you have the sun here. And we have a Sunday law. Now, just, just so, we, so you get this, and I don't forget it, what's the Father going to do here? You know in advance. Right? What's the Father going to do here? He's going to speak, isn't he? He's going to say, this is my beloved Son. Hear ye him? Something along those lines. At this way mark, is there a speaking? Yes, this, this is the ass speaking. This is Zechariah speaking. This is the United States speaking. This is the Father speaking. This is where speaking takes place. Therefore, is there a speaking over here? Yes, it's the Father speaking in this story. Almost done. Um, but it's, it's too good to really race through, so just give me a few seconds. The disciples are waking. Help me with that. What does that mean? 
When do the disciples awake? At the midnight cry. cry. What's the midnight cry? It's that very way, Mark. Okay. The disciples awaking, behold the flood of glory that illuminates the mount. In fear and amazement, they gaze upon the radiant form of their master. As they become able to endure the wondrous light, they see that Jesus is not alone. Beside him are two heavenly beings in close converse with him. They are Moses, who upon Sinai had talked with God, and Elijah, to whom the high privilege was given, granted to but one other of the sons of Adam, never to come under the power of death. Upon Mount Pisgah, 15 centuries before Moses had stood gazing upon the land of promise, but because of his sin at Meribah, it was not for him to enter there. Not for him was the joy of leading the host of Israel into the inheritance of their fathers. His agonized entreaty, I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain and Lebanon was refused. The hope that for 40 years had lighted up the darkness of the desert wanderings must be denied. A wilderness grave was the goal of those years of toil and heart-burdening care. But he who is able to do exceedingly above all that we ask or think had in this measure answered his servant's prayer. Moses passed under the dominion of death but was not to remain in the tomb. Christ himself called called him forth to life. Satan, the tempter, had claimed the body. Christ had called him forth to life. Satan, the tempter, had claimed the body of Moses because of sin, but Christ, the Savior, brought him forth from the grave. Jude 9. I was at the sentence before. Moses, upon the Mount of Transfiguration, was a witness to Christ's victory over sin and death. He represented those who shall come forth from the grave at the resurrection of the just. Elijah, who had been translated to heaven without seeing death, represented those who will be living on the earth at Christ's second coming and who will be changed in a moment and the twinkling of the eye at the last trump when this mortal must put on immortality and this corruptible must put on incorruption. Jesus was clothed with the light of heaven and he will appear when he shall come the second time without sin unto salvation for he will come in the glory of his father with the holy angels. The Savior's promise to his disciples was now fulfilled upon the mount. The future kingdom of glory was represented in miniature. Christ the king, Moses a representative of the risen saints, and Elijah of the translated ones. Let me ask you the question. In this movement, when we've taught Paneum as a waymark, and we lined it up with the end of the world, what do we identify Paneum as at the end of the world? The second coming of Christ. Okay, that's this just is an agreement. Paneum, we see at the transfiguration, we see the ensign lifted up, we see the second coming illustrated. And Moses and Elijah represent God's people. And what's the connection with Moses and Elijah? Pardon me, the law and the prophet? Okay, yeah, there's a good connection. Elijah's a prophet, Moses was the law. But They both understood the character of God, did they not? They both knew the character of God. Where did they get that revelation? They both went into the same cave, the same cave on Horeb, and saw the Lord pass by. So there's a, there's a strong connection between these two. The disciples do not yet comprehend the scene, but they rejoice that the patient teacher, the meek and lowly one who has wandered to and fro of a helpless stranger, is honored by the favored ones of heaven. They believe that Elijah has come to announce the Messiah's reign and that the kingdom of Christ is about to be set up on earth. <laughs> there's, there's still holding on to misconceptions. The memory of their fear and disappointment that they would banish forever. Here, where the glory of God is revealed, they long to tarry. Peter explains, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Elias. The disciples are confident that Moses and Elijah have been sent to protect their master and to establish his authority as king. They see it but they don't understand it. But the crown must come, but before the crown must come the cross. 
Not the inauguration of Christ as king, but the decease to be accomplished at Jerusalem is the subject of their conference with Jesus. Bearing the weakness of humanity and burden with its sorrow and sin, Jesus walked alone in the midst of men. Um, okay. Really profound stuff. Let me bring it to conclusion. What I'm saying is... December 17th, 2016, the Lord removed his hand from a foundational understanding in this movement. We thought the Soviet Union was the king of the South. We then realized that Russia was the king of the South. The Lord has opened up several specific lines of prophecy that become part of this message, this message being the midnight cry message, which comes in three parts. The understanding of Ezra 7-9 that gives us the pattern of the, the lines, 120 days, followed by 70 days, um, takes us to the opening up of the sanctuary to the prophets, Ezekiel, Isaiah, John, it takes us to the 2520, takes us to Gideon and Daniel 2 and Daniel 4. And in Matthew 16, I've been making the case that Matthew 16 is the second witness for Palmoni and Daniel 8.13. And as we were dealing with these chronological, numerical revelations from Palmoni, I've added to the mix that it is in, in God's word that chapter 44, 45, and 46, at least in the Conflict of Ages series and in the Bible, when you come to chapters 44, 45, and 46, it lines up right here. And that when Sister White was commenting on Caesarea Philippi, and Matthew 16, it was chapter 45. Chapter 45 is identifying the history of Trump as a prophetic symbol, the 45th president of the United States, 44th and 45th. Um, this kind of numerical revelation is beyond human calculation. It, it, it has to be divine. Um, and from there... I think I've made, made these points about tying these together. So the next time I come back, I will probably flip the board over and we'll begin looking at the kingdom of the beast, the kingdom of the dragon, the kingdom of the false prophet, and the kingdom of the 144,000 and wind this, this down um, or wind it up. Don't want to forget anything in, that I would regret. I have something I want to read, but I don't have to read it right here. Um, oh, ah, I have one other thing. This history, if you look at uh, verse 44 and 45, 44th and 45th president of the United States, um, I'm saying that that history, the history here is Daniel Daniel's last vision, okay? And that Daniel's last vision is three chapters, chapter 10, 11, and 12. And I started here by giving a little bit of the nuances of Daniel 12, 1, okay? 12 plus 1 is 13. This is rebellion when Michael stands up, the height of rebellion. But it's also illustrating Christ, the 1, and the 144,000, the 12. Um, but the preceding history that leads to Daniel 12, 1, and that line of prophecy, is Daniel 10 and 11. And I'm saying that Daniel 10 and 11 takes place in the history of midnight. Okay, because midnight is a progressive period of time. And so, if you take Daniel 10 and Daniel 11 and add them, what do you get? 21. And what is 21 a symbol of? Midnight. Okay, so Daniel 10 and 11 is telling us about the history that leads to the close of human probation. And Daniel 12, 1 is the close of probation, all the same vision, but these numerical revelations, they're just not... I, I, I have someone close to me that's a little bit... And I'm frustrated is probably not the right word, but stumble's not the right word either challenged. Okay, they're challenged. When you begin to see that Christ knew everything 
from the beginning and, and, and actually addresses everything in his word in advance, uh, it, it can provide a stumbling block for someone that, that starts grappling with the idea of predestination. Okay, it's all, it's all laid out in advance. What choice is there? It's all there. And uh, that's okay that people struggle with that. You need to get beyond that, though. Um, but the reality of it is that the harder we look, the deeper we look, the more that Christ has had, his, has had providential control of every element of his word, of the spirit of prophecy, and of history. Um, but it still comes down to the, to the fact that the 6,000 years of sin can be boiled down to one word. It's called choice. Sin was brought into this 6,000 years through a choice of Eve and then Adam. And before they made their choice, Christ had already made his choice, saying, if this happens, I choose to come and die for that choice that those that are lost because of Adam and Eve's choice would have opportunity to make the choice for salvation after the fact. Amen. So it, the, way, the control that he has, the governing that he has done upon his word in both the meaning of words and numbers is more than amazing. Um, but it does not uphold the concept of predestination because it's all about choice. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we once again consider what's happening now on planet Earth, in this country, in our local areas, and we believe that even if this pandemic were to end in a very short time, that your word is very clear that end time events the crisis comes as a woman in travail and that when one labor pain is passed sooner than you think the next one comes and then the next one and the next one. We're seeing that we are now in the final movements uh, leading to Sunday legislation in this country. Um, we, we ask that if we have the privilege to participate in the work of giving a warning that you would allow us to do so and that you'd give us the wisdom to do it in a winning way. Bless these uh, presentations that we're putting out on the web, we ask. Uh, bless our day's activity now as we part ways. And we once again uh, pray for the many uh, that we have contact with that are struggling with various things, especially some of our brothers and sisters that are having uh, grave uh, physical challenges at this time. Pray for them and their families. In Jesus' name, amen.